All right, thank you. Welcome. Very good to have you joining us here. My name is Ryan Hines. I'm the communications manager at Biomin, and we are here for the continuation of our antibiotic production expert series. Today's topic is how acids can support antibiotic free swine production. I'm joined again by two guests who we've seen in a previous episode, Natalia Roth and Diego Padlon. Natalia, let's start with you. Hi there. Hi, Ryan. It's good to have you. Good to see you again. Um, would you introduce yourself for our live audience today? Of course, sure. So my name is Natalia Roth. Um, I'm really thankful for your organization, Ryan, and inviting me and give, providing the possibility to talk to you. Um, my role uh, now in uh, company Biomin is a global product line manager assets. <clears throat> And uh, due to my PhD, I'm also uh, in the role of expert of antibiotic use and antibiotic resistance. So you can see I could combine those two uh, topics uh, and uh, um, I'm happy to talk about that today. Well, we're going to be happy to hear some of the insights that you bring to us. Uh, but before we get to your remarks, let's go ahead and welcome our second expert. Hi there, Diego. Good morning, Ryan. Good morning, everybody. Good to see you. Why don't you uh, go ahead and introduce yourself again to our audience? Yeah, maybe somebody knows me already. I've been working 13 years in uh, Biomin as a TSM. Now I have established an advisory company doing the same as we're doing before, supporting sales and customers in the field about the swine production and welfare. Excellent. So it's great to have both of you joining us today. Uh, it's great for our live audience to be joining us as well. I just wanted to point out uh, that as we proceed over the next hour, uh, this is an interactive session. So that means two things. It means, first of all, at any point, if you have a question uh, for either Diego or Natalia, you can go ahead and enter that into the chat function here in the GoToWebinar platform. Uh, in addition, it means we're gonna ask you a couple of questions so you can participate and weigh in on the discussion. All right. So with that, we've got a lot of ground to cover. We um, are going to start with Natalia. So Natalia, why don't you please introduce us to this topic? Mm -hmm. um, yes, I'm very happy to talk today about uh, how acids can support antibiotic free spine production. And uh, top, uh, talking about uh, swine production, I believe we all know the global scope of swine production in general. So there are a few countries that are, are producing uh, swine, and you see here the numbers in uh, million heads. So the main producer uh, is China, and then we have a large production European Union, United States, and following and by Brazil. Talking about antibiotic use, in general, we have a good data set uh, from about antibiotic on antibiotic use in Europe from European Union, and I know that many uh, of you, those who are from European Union, knows this data, but maybe for some uh, other uh, attendees, and I know that we have attendees globally also from China, that could be something new that I therefore I would like to introduce it and uh, to show it here. So antibiotic use, um, here we can see the picture of antibiotic use in various European countries. I'll put it to the laser pointer. Um, and the units are a population correction unit and milligram per kilogram. It means data shows us how much antibiotics countries use to produce one kilogram of meat. Data is for total antibiotic use for total uh, for all uh, animals, but majority of antibiotics are used in swine production. So what do we see here? The numbers are presented from 2010 to 2018, and we see that some countries are able to use less amount of antibiotics to produce um, the same amount of meat. Some countries use more and we need to recognize that there was a, a huge achievement to reduce, strongly reduce uh, antibiotic consumption for animals uh, for many countries, actually for almost all countries, like we can see here in Spain, the reduction is by the half, which is really, really great. As such, antibiotic use we all know is not 
a problem. It would be not a problem if there would be not a problem of antibiotic resistance. The right side shows us the antibiotic resistance situation. That means the data show us how um, many E. coli that were tested um, for antibiotic resistance were susceptible. It means not resistant to any antibiotics shown in the uh, light green color or resistant and multi-resistant to different antibiotics. And of course, it seems very, like if you connect those two pictures, it's very clearly that some countries like Ireland, Poland, uh, that are able to use less amount of antibiotics, the resistance level is also low. And some countries that have a high amount of antibiotics or use high amount of antibiotics, resistance uh, level is high. Yeah, that's the reason why we talk about this um, topic, why it is reasonable to reduce antibiotic consumption and to, to, to understand the problem of antibiotic resistance. And Natalia, those are the um, sort of country level figures. Those are averaged out um, across productions. Uh, why don't we now turn to our audience and ask them about their opinion on the consequences of antimicrobial resistance yeah? as they see it. So we're going to start our first poll question here. What are the main consequences of antibiotic resistance that you can observe on your farm? Or if you're a consultant, that you observe on the farms which you serve. Uh, and you can select any of the answers that you believe apply. Does it lead to ineffective treatment? Does it lead to higher treatment costs? Is there a risk of spread of antibiotic resistant bacteria to farm staff and to other people? Perhaps you're not sure or none. You don't see any consequences of antibiotic resistance. We're gonna give everyone a chance to weigh in here. That's an important question share your perspective and then we're going to read out those results right so we'll immediately display what it is you think about this topic as those results are coming in we're going to give everyone just one more moment and with half of everyone let's see there we go okay great uh it looks like the majority has been able to vote so we're going to go ahead and close that poll and share those results right on screen with you now Here's what you had to say in terms of the main consequences that you're observing uh, from antibiotic resistance on farms is by far the first and main consequence is ineffective treatments. Uh, also coming in second, that's at 79%, coming in second, the risk of the spread of antibiotic resistant bacteria to humans at 49% and closely followed by higher treatment costs at 40%. Now, Natalia, uh, how does that match up? Has, is the prioritization and what you see uh, in in real farm scenarios is does that match? Does that match with the literature? What do you? What's your opinion? Uh, absolutely, it, it is a problem. Uh, antibiotic, and I agree also. Let's look on the consequences of antibiotic resistance. So, what do we see here? Um, in general, we know all that antibiotic resistance is a serious threat to global public health. This connection that you are saying, antibiotic uh, that uh, resistant transmission from uh, animals to humans, we live in one ecosystem, in one environment. And there is a reason why we find such a high uh, prevalence of antibiotic resistant bacteria and uh, resistant genes in a wild animal population animals that never have received antibiotic treatment. Um, I, I absolutely agree that antibiotic resistance leads to non or less effective antimicrobial treatment, which costs, of course, a high cost on antimicrobial treatment itself, but also a high cost of, of animal production or for animal production, because if this, we cannot treat the disease properly, we have a higher losses. And that's actually the point where the farmers really feels the consequences. The risk of um, uh, high prevalence of AMA in animals and especially in farm staff, because link, this link between animals and is humans, somewhere it's more present in some places than in others, but it's very clearly that this link is there with, for people that 
work with animals, that are in closer contact with animals, or that's uh, where we really see the spread of resistance. And environmental pollution around the farm, it's of course one of the consequences. That's why you know, we, are, we care and we are concerned about the problem. Um, but actually, how it is, how do we know about the level of antibiotic resistance on the farm. So during uh, our research uh, programs and evaluations, it was very, very interesting, the experience to go to the farm and then just to check. And uh, then it was a recognition of the farm owner. Oh, the problem is not a problem somewhere. Uh, it's my problem because this is the level of, of resistance that I have in my farm. And this was um, uh, interesting also for, um, understanding uh, the uh, of the problem so what do we offer now we have um, how to detect antibiotic resistance but not only it's not only about antibiotic resistance antibiotic resistance is one part of it but also uh, evaluate the microbiota of animals on site on the farm so there is a possibility we have established um, the monitoring uh, of um, Antimicrobial, uh, of antimicrobial resistance, but as well as um, microbiota with the support of uh, nanopore sequencing. Um, we go to the farm, take samples, or there is also a possibility that we get samples, um, for example, fecal samples uh, with a tube that we send to, to the farm owner. If we are on site and we take samples by ourselves, it is possible to extract DNA uh, on site. We can do it in the hotel room, even within uh, three, four days. And the next uh, uh, couple of days, we do um, use a um, bioinformatics tool to evaluate all the data set. I said, and we uh, receive very interesting insights from one side for our research to understand the situation, but from our side also to to this uh, for specific farm to, to answer many questions, to understand the problem and to provide a solution. So we have conducted such uh, microbiome analysis in different uh, poultry farms worldwide, and we have established this analysis also for swine. Unfortunately, COVID situation keeps us back a little bit so that we cannot go and proceed and uh, do the evaluation on uh, wider uh, for a wider variety of uh, farms, but we hope that the situation will improve soon. So why do we do it? Why do we evaluate microbiome? Because in the microbiome, the gut microbiome especially, there is a lot of information that is connected to the gut physiology, to the metabolic uh, function of the microbiota, gut microbiota. And this is, a, of course, connected to the health of the animal, to the nutrition of the animal, and the growth, because we want to grow our animal healthy. This metagen uh, metagenomic analysis of the intestinal uh, content of swine is an example. It provides a lot of information, and sometimes, um, you know, too much information doesn't help, but getting more information and more structure and better understanding, it's a really very great tool to understand. So what can we understand? What can we detect? First, we can conduct the taxonomical profiling of the microbes in the gut. It means we can answer the question, who is in the gut? We can uh, evaluate the microbial diversity of the microbiota in the gut. We can profile uh, the antibiotic resistant genes and understand and know what is the resistome load. But very important is the virulome load or the pathogenome load. So the load of Bacteria, also pathogenic bacteria that is virulent, and those are the disease-causing agent at the end of the day. So it's important to keep this, this uh, part low and to reduce it and provide solution to it. So how do we do it? We here, this is just an example. Uh, we have four different treatments. It can be named just A, B, C, D. It could be one of the treatment can be antibiotic because when it's needed or, or for some countries, antibiotic growth promoters are also allowed. And this is also a solution uh, for, for some countries that is possible, but it is also possible to see what other solution do we have. And with that, uh, what, is the in, what is the influence of the solution, different solutions on the resistome in the gut? Um, 
often conducting this analysis, um, we just do not want to be biased and do not even know which solution is applied where. We just get samples and analyze it, provide it to the farm on the owner and discuss the results. So this is something really interesting. It's possible to um, understand the alpha diversity measures. It means um, the abundance of the microbiota as well as Shannon index, which combines the abundance and the diversity of the microbial load. Very important is the abundance of the pathogenome in the gut, because that's where we can uh, we can see the differences for uh, and also recognize some problems that are on the farm and understand it better and provide the solutions. Talking about solutions, so you know this this uh, presentation is actually about assets. So how can assets be used as a solution? And generally, it's I think everybody knows. So the reduction in antibiotic is not something very easy to do. It's possible, we saw it as an example in Europe, and now we observe it also in other regions like China is very successful as well in this direction. But um, it needs to be clear, and we all know, antibiotics are needed and we need them to keep them as a treatment because if animals are sick, they deserve to be treated with antibiotics. So it's, and there is unfortunately no other replacement available. So that's the way where antibiotics should remain. Therefore, our target is to reduce antibiotic use, but completely antibiotic free is maybe not a um, very correct way to be it. Um, also right on the ethical uh, perspective. But it is important to reduce, for sure. How to reduce? One part is biosecurity and management <clears throat> that play a large role in the prevention of disease. And another part is the other nutritional strategies. And one of the nutritional strategies is the application of acids. There are also other feed additives that can support, but today we talk about acids that can use uh, can be used to replace antibiotics for growth promotion. And we have a big success now uh, with uh, seeing the results, especially in China, because uh, antibiotic growth promoters were banned last year in China. And we see a, a, a very good um, result with uh, our assets with, where we um, use um, our products to replace crops and waters in China. And in Europe, we talk about the prevention of disease. And sometimes understanding the situation properly and using biosecurity and management, it's important. It's, it's possible to prevent, to use acids as a preventative tool. Just talking about some research with acids, because in the past I was leading the further development projects uh, of um, and assets and um, what we were doing there, how we were conducting our research. So in general, we were evaluating the antimicrobial activity of single assets and the combinations of assets. And you may know that if we talk about bacteria, pathogenic bacteria, especially acids are stronger if we talk about the uh, activity on gram-negative bacteria in comparison. So it's stronger against gram-negative in comparison to gram-positive. We were evaluating also the synergies with pathogenic compounds. So there are synergies with acids because two acids sometimes are more active than just additive effect, but also with phytogenic compounds, there is possibility to have a strong antimicrobial effect again, especially against gram negative as well. Because um, phytogenic compounds are known to have a strong effect against gram positive, but sometimes it is the combination we could identify some compounds like cinnamaldehyde that is really strong against gram negative. We are, we are focusing our uh, research also on the measurements of the penetration or potential of bacterial membranes, because we know um, gram negative bacteria have a special um, structure of the cell wall, and that serves as a barrier. And to, to go through this barrier is important um, and to enable the penetration of acids into the cell of gram-negative bacteria um, brings a lot of benefit to target the uh, gram-negative bacteria. We were uh, checking the influence of uh, different substances as, as, uh, as well as different acids on efflux pumps activity. The efflux pumps are pumps on the cell wall of gram-negative bacteria. They are able to pump out the uh, antimicrobial substances 
like antibiotics, but also acids, because cell wants to get rid of substances that is um, harmful to the cell. So we were conducting many in vitro trials, studying the efficacy and mode uh, mold of action of, of substances, and uh, many in vivo trials, evaluating the effects of antibiotics and feed additives on gut health and animal health. Of course, we were not doing it alone, and we have fortunately uh, a large support with many cooperation uh, partners uh, worldwide that you could see the names here below. Uh, with our approach, to develop products against gram-negative. We were actually on the correct way, and there was a recent publication um, in 2018, actually, that was reviewing 57,000 publications on what are the most important pathogens in swine. And oh, E. coli and salmonella, so those are gram-negative bacteria, are, were identified as the pathogens that cause uh, problems globally. And just to show some um, data um, in this regard, we have developed, uh, we have um, evaluated um, some substances that are actually um, enhancing the activity of acids. So here we can see the inhibition power of uh, acids on different strains of Salmonella and E. coli, and this you can see a stronger inhibition of the, this uh, green column, which shows the combination of acids with so-called permeabilizing complex, because this complex enables to permeate the uh, cell wall of gram-negative bacteria, and therefore the inhibition of bacteria uh, is stronger, and the efficacy is stronger. So we have developed uh, a solution for the reduction of gram-negative bacterial challenge, not as a treatment, never as a treatment, because this is the role of antibiotics, but as a preventive, as a prevention. So our products have contained permeabilizing complex that permeabilize uh, the bacterial cell wall and enhances the efficacy of active ingredients. Um, and cinnamaldehyde is a compound in many of our products because of the synergy with organic acids. Cinnamaldehyde is also bacterial, uh, is able to inhibit bacterial growth and it plays a large role in quorum quenching. And you know, quorum quenching uh, for sure is the way how bacteria communicate. And sometimes it's not only about the presence of bacteria, but it's about the influence on the bacterial communication. With that, we have the power to reduce the virulence of bacteria. And of course, the combination of acids is the second part. We uh, apply our solution via feed continuously, it's possible to, and uh, um, also via water. Both ways is possible. It's possible to provide the solution continuously, um, but also um, when it is needed. If we see there is something happening with animals and uh, maybe they have a higher stress, it's possible to apply acids via water. What do we see with our in vivo effects. I cannot, unfortunately, do not have time to go to uh, many details, but just a general picture. We could see that our product reduced salmonella and E. coli in the gut. So we could see then here are some trials and the reduction of salmonella uh, in percentage. <coughs> also, salmon, a reduction of salmonella in um, feces, a uh, reduction of uh, coliforms in E. coli uh, uh, in ileum, so in the parts of the gut. Um, and here we can see a better reduction in comparison to the control group that did not receive um, um, uh, acids. Or um, we could see also the level of positive bacteria like lactobacilli and bifidobacteria in ileum. So the numbers were higher in comparison to the control group, which is also important. Um, as I said, it's not only about their numbers or only. So it's important also to look on the virulence and bacteria E. coli adhesion and lesion score are these factors that show us the virulence and pathogenicity of E. coli and salmonella. So in some trials, we could see the reduced level of bacterial adhesion in percentage in jejunum and ileum, or a lesion score in some tissues like gut tissues, liver, lymph nodes on spleen could be observed. Um, in animals that uh, received biotronic. So in general, we see uh, a very positive effect. And of course, if you want to grow 
our animals strong and healthy, we need to pay attention on gut function and growth performance. And we have a couple of trials that show that application of the product leads to a better uh, gut structure, better improved ability height and crypt uh, depths uh, from one side. Uh, also improved digestibility like, uh, because of intake retention of excretion of nitrogen. In this case, improved um, uh, inulin-like growth factor and in general, we just improved performance, growth performance, improved weight of animals in comparison to the control group that does not receive. And I know that Diego will show you some data also in the comparison even to the antibiotic group, because we are talking here about also about the replacement of antibiotics. So we have a couple of trials there that will be presented by Diego. So just to answer the question, how acids can support reduced use of antibiotics? It is a really good tool uh, for the AGP replacement. We had experience in Europe because we were using a lot of our products for AGP replacement in Europe. Now we enjoy this uh, success and because it's a support uh, where we see a measurable benefits for farm in China and uh, globally in many countries as well. And it is also a tool for disease prevention, especially if we talk about the disease prevention of wood crumb negative bacteria, because here the product is developed, uh, are developed this way. Uh, we recommend also to use acids during and after the treatment of antibiotics, if the treatment is needed for disease prevention, just to rebuild the positive microbiota and to reduce the load, the load of antibiotic resistant bacteria. I just showed this trial with um, uh, ESBL producing E. coli. ESBL stands for extended spectrum beta lactamase producing E. coli. Um, we can see here that on number day one of the trial, we have around the same level of ESBL producing um, bacteria in animals of the control group, um, group that were fed with acids and antibiotic group. On this, then from day one to day seven, antibiotic was applied and we can see that ESBL, in this case, ampicillin was applied. We could see that um, ESBL uh, number was higher in the antibiotic group, significantly higher in comparison to the um, acid acidifier group. And that's actually a very interesting achievement. And this was, um, we could see this observation until the day 56 of the trial, despite the fact that antibiotic was not applied at this period of time. So I have conducted PhD and the part of my work was to evaluate how acids influence antibiotic resistant bacterial population. And we could see um, in swine, but also in poultry, that using uh, this solution reduces the load of resistant bacteria. So um, that's something that um, actually comes always uh, almost to the end of my presentation. But I think, Ryan, you have one more question to the audience, right? Absolutely, uh, because you've shown us uh essentially the, the effects in vivo, as you've explained, that uh, you've got the decrease in pathogens, you explained with E. coli and salmonella, uh, the benefits for that animals in terms of there's less virulence, bacteria less pathogenic, animals actually grow faster or healthier. Um, but what about antibiotic resistance itself, right? So now that we have the role of acids um, clearly defined by Natalia, it has an impact on the bacteria, but does it, is it possible to reverse antibiotic resistance itself? I go ahead and just take a moment. We see that everyone has jumped in quite quickly now to answer the question. And it's an important question here, right? Uh, the options here are yes, no, or not sure. We're gonna give everyone just a moment to answer this second poll question. Then as we did before, we're gonna go ahead and read out your thoughts on this topic. And give it everyone just one more moment to weigh in. We're going to go ahead and close the poll. Let me share those results right now. And here's what you had to say 60% of you have said that yes, we think antibiotic resistance is reversible. 26% said no, and 14% not sure. Natalia, what does the science have to say? 
Yes, thank you, Ryan, for raising this question. Um, I think it's it's really interesting question. I I mean, I believe the answers are all right because it depends on which resistance and which antibiotic do we talk about in general. Mm -hmm. uh, in general, we can say that antibiotic resistance is reversible due to the monitoring data of many regions. This is again just European situation, but we have great data from Japan or also from other countries where we could see that reduce antibiotic uh, use and this data are from uh, from Netherlands leads to reduce antibiotic resistance level in different uh, for different um, animal species but it is also true that not for every single antibiotic and antibiotic resistance this is true because sometimes we observe core and cross resistance with other antibiotics but also with other uh, uh, elements that are not antibiotics. That is a very interesting topic. But in general, I think it's it's a great um, and interesting outcome that if you reduce the antibiotic use, the resistance level goes down. And that actually provides us a big hope uh, and the motivation to continue and to reduce antibiotic resistance further. I think I uh, am at the end of my presentation and I would like to switch over to you and Diego. Absolutely, we'll do that now. Uh, Diego, we're gonna give you control of the slides in just a moment, but let us take an opportunity to find out a little bit more about our audience before we do so. So let's go to our third and final poll question here. Uh, when we talk about antibiotic free production, how much of your production is currently antibiotic free? Go ahead and choose the one best answer that fits your situation less than 25%, between 26 and 50%, between 51 and 75%, or more than 75%. We're gonna go ahead and give you, again, just a moment to go ahead and choose the one best answer that fits your situation. If you're in a consulting or an independent role, go ahead and um, pick the selection you think is most representative of what you see in the field. And we're going to go ahead and share those results out for a moment for everyone in just a moment as we continue this discussion on the role of acids in antibiotic free production. And now that we see the majority of you have had a chance to vote, let's go ahead and see what you had to say. Here are those results. 45% uh, of you said that less than 25% of your production is antibiotic free currently. 30% said between 26 and 50%. 13% of you said that it's between 51 and 75%. And another 13%, the same amount, uh, said there's more than 76%. And Diego, based on all your years of experience, as you mentioned in the introduction, uh, how does that correspond to what you see when you go and visit customers? Uh, we are uh, more or less, we are still on the way to establish a clear concept, a clear knowledge about uh, and behavior at the end of the day, how to produce antibiotic free or uh, antibiotic very low because antibiotic free, I think is uh, not so easy, but uh, many people, many farms, many players in the, in the peak production are trying, are adapting their production to decrease as much as possible the use of antibiotics. This is all over the world, all over the world. And so the, the, the answers to your questions are exactly showing that people are on the way, still on the way. But uh, tomorrow we cannot use zinc oxide. Uh, in a few years, we cannot use many other antibiotics. So we have to hurry up not wait for or wait to the last second but this is what is happening for the time being because it's easy and i will explain why okay and, and let's go to that right now yeah um, i'm going to go ahead and give you control so you can bring up uh, your prepared remarks uh, on the screen for everyone and of course as part of that transition we've seen that acids have a place and they can can add value for producers as well okay can you see my Yes, we do. It's perfect. Go ahead. 
I go back. Okay. So what we were saying, what was the, the scenario? Well, still in some countries the scenario. Before, it was allowed to use antibiotics as growth promoter in growing finishing period. It was allowed, uh, or in some countries still allowed to use as a preventive at weaning, growing, farrowing, and treatment. Uh, treatments are administered in all situations without antibiogram. It's like a panacea. You have a problem, you switch on the antibiotic. After three, five, seven days, you switch off, and you think is, uh, is solved. It's not so, but most of the time, looks like it's working. After we have the ban of antibiotic growth promoters, with no more growth promotion by antimicrobial means, uh, this made uh, the reappearance without the reappearance of Rosonia that was kept uh, hidden or in subclinical uh, condition. Uh, the preventive use uh, is uh, allowed only in particular documented reasons. You have to show that you have a real reason to implement uh, uh, preventive use of antibiotic. Otherwise, you are not allowed in many countries, not all, you are not allowed anymore to use it. And treatment administration ought to be implemented only with the antibiogram to prove that you are applying exactly the antibiotic that is the more efficient, the more successful against the specific bug that is causing the is causing the the problem or the disease. Well, in the antibiotic free strategy, nutrition solutions have a very important, a very important role. To go to the to why you know this uh, you know this uh, graph uh, and I think in the last years you have seen many times. But what I want you to I want to stress for you to show that the most used antibiotics, tetracyclines, beta lactamines, and uh, fluoroquinolones are the most used the most used for every kind more, yeah, mostly gram negative, but they are the most used. What means that fluorophenicol, enrofloxacin, ceftiofur, tetracycline, amoxicillin, they are wide spectrum antibiotics, it means that when we use them, we kill not only the target bug, but a huge variety of others that are useful and most of the times are competing in the gut with the pathogen that is causing the problem. So it is an emergency. The antibiotic use must be seen as an emergency intervention. Otherwise, it's better to prevent or to use other means. OK, if, you see, if we see the disease pattern among pigs, you see the most of the time, in general, the biggest problem happened at winning, and we know that. And along the growing fattening process, mainly when we, we move the pigs, because we move, we load, we mix the animal. And if there is a silent infection, may explode in disease or anyway is causing problems. And is normal after moving animals to apply an antibiotics. The fact that at weaning we have the most of the problems is giving a reason why from the average daily dose, this is from there from Denmark, but it's the same all over the world, the most of antibiotics are applied in the gastro for the gastrointestinal problems. Okay, so this is the point. In the moment weaning. In the in the district is gastrointestinal is seeing the most of the use and there we use wider spectrum antibiotic killing an enormous variety variety of uh, of bacteria. Another consideration: the main pathogens in the gut for pigs are E. coli, Lozonia, Brachyspira, Salmonella, Clostridia. Excluding Clostridia, that is a, a gram positive, 
the and the E. coli that is extracellular parasite, so uh, is a lay, is in the gut where the antibiotics is acting. The other three, Rosonia and Salmonella, are intracellular parasite. It means they parasite the uh, epithelial cells of the gut, and when they are inside the cell, there is no antibiotic able to reach them and to kill them. Brachyspira, on her part, is behaving as an intracellular because it's hiding inside the necrotic tissue that is creating on the surface of the of the gut mucosa. And so the three and the majority of the gut pathogens are intracellular or potentially intracellular parasites. This means that the use of antibiotics is working only for the bugs present in the lumen. What is uh, inside there, you cannot reach, you cannot kill. And so antibiotics are not absolutely strategic because after you stop the, the application of antibiotics after three, five, seven days, in a few days, you have the coming back of the problem. So it's not the solution. The solution is keeping these bugs under continued pressure and adverse environment. And in this case, is uh, why antacids can enter with a big space in antibiotic-free protocol because they have antibiotic uh, antimicrobial activity, both as environment, because uh, uh, pathogen, gut pathogens are uh, not uh, acidophiles, are basophiles, and uh, when they are not uh, uh, they are not uh, how do you say they 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 um, separated by their their hydrogen they kill directly the bacteria entering the body of the bacteria so they have antimicrobial activity they are selective they don't kill just Many, but they are selective against gram negative mainly. They are easy to use, excluding that some up, sometimes they are irritant, but they are easy to use. They put you put inside the cost is a relative, and you put inside for long periods and without any problem because they are safe and they don't see any resistance if there's not very little adaptation. There is no resistance against acidity. And so you can use for a long time without creating anti uh, resistance. And then, furthermore, acids are enhancing protein digestibility, that is the pabulum from for gut pathogens. They inhibit ammonia production. They stimulate pancreatic secretion, improving furthermore the digestibility. They stimulate growth of intestinal villi, improving the surface of absorption of nutrients and they improve gastric and intestinal flora and so they create competition against pathogens and whenever you use it, you know that uh, uh, a mix of acids as is present in the in the biome product a mix of acid are better because they can act at different pH and they can cover different levels of the gastrointestinal tract. And whenever acids are applied, there is a higher growth and higher uh, a higher feed consumption and higher growth. So even if you don't see the effect on the pathogen that is there. For sure, you the, the product is paid off, but uh, better growth and feed conversion. And this is shown by several. We here I put together three trials uh, done in China, Hungary, and uh, Honduras by Biomin, showing what, that when you apply uh, the product uh, that is uh, top three, top three, okay. You have uh, you decrease for sure the pH in, in feed that is important mainly for piglets, but you decrease uh, the, the the buffer capacity of the feed and its pH. You decrease uh, the pH in stomach and jejunum where you need uh, to compete. 
you improve lactobacilli and bifidobacteria that are the positive but, uh, uh, bugs that improve digestibility, produce vitamins and whatever, you decrease the, the potential pathogens or pathogens, in this case, E. coli and salmonella, and at the end you have higher growth and better fruit conversion. This is the effect of acids. And there is not side, there are no side effects. And with this, I'm over with my short presentation. And I thank you for listening. And I'm ready for the questions. Wonderful. I'm very glad to hear that. Thank you, Diego, for your remarks. Uh, so we're going to open this up now to uh, the Q and A portion of today's session. We've already received a few questions, but I invite anyone uh, who has a question in mind to go ahead and enter that into the chat and we're going to get to as many of these as we can uh, but let's go ahead and start with natalia uh, we had a question about this analysis that you've shown right so you took us from uh, the sort of country level usage of antibiotics and antibiotic resistance all the way down to the specific farm research that uh, you and other biomine colleagues have done to analyze animals microbiome uh, at that farm level. What what are the main benefits of that? What do you get out of that uh, for a farmer, a producer? Uh, what is it you can do with that sort of insight, the main advantages? Mm -hmm. uh, I think the main uh, interest uh, of the farmer, the main advantage for the farmer um, is to provide the solution to identify the problem that is on the farm and to provide the solution for them. So because in these different uh, houses, we always take trial where we have uh, do trials where we conduct uh, different treatments. One treatment could be antibiotic, uh, another treatment could be acid, and another treatment could be a different product or a different uh, level of the product. So, and this is always, uh, the level depends on the problem. And with that approach, we can provide a customer solution to the problem of this farm. So we support with identification of the problem, of the pathogens that are available, um, making awareness about the um, antibiotic resistance load, but and also that sometimes antibiotic does not do what we hope it should do if we talk about the preventative use of antibiotics or, or uh, antibiotic growth promoters. So some of the trials were conducted in the countries where antibiotic growth promoters are used and the role of this, uh, and it is very often not clear that alternatives are available and easy to use. And with that trial, we could show it very clearly. Okay, great. And as you mentioned, um, that's really where acids um, can play a key role is in that prevention of, of problems with gram negative bacteria. Exactly, yes. Uh, uh, we, we see this and observe this with also with our research, Vitro and Vivo, targeting gram negative bacteria is one part uh, of acids because acids are more just than antimicrobial effect because we talk about pH reduction, as Diego showed also, uh, pH reduction in the stomach, reduction of buffer capacity of feed. It's important also feed hygiene, water hygiene. This is all important and the role of acids, like classical role of acids that was used in decades. But now what is new and different is the targeted approach against gram negative bacteria in the gut and evaluation and of samples from the gut and so the activity of acids in the animal. Um, that's something maybe that uh, was um, a different or a new research in the last year, years. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And you mentioned pH, so I do want to get to that because we had a question about it. Uh, Diego did uh, talk about the varying efficacies of different acids in the gut and different places in the gastrointestinal tract. Is there a, a minimum pH or is there a target pH uh, that, that one would have in mind or aim to achieve in an antibiotic-free pig system? You want me to answer? Okay, by the po uh, practical point of view, uh, you cannot change uh, the pH of the intestine. No way. No way, because the buffer system by pancreatic juices and whatever is very efficient. That's why the protection or the absorbing, absorbing system uh, or slow release medium of uh, top three is, uh, is a genial, a genial solution. 
you can decrease a bit uh, the stomach because in the in the piglets the pH is not uh, is not low enough or the acidity of the of the stomachs of uh, piglets is not efficient and they are and these uh, is prepared to process the milk protein that need a pH of let's say 3.5 then they switch to uh, to a vegetable based uh, diet with protein that need a pH of 3.3 to be digested and this is a gap that uh, the piglet is not able to to to, to cover so a little support and not too big a little support in uh, stomach acidity yes the target would be 3.3 another point in the water it's not a three but a top liquid application the target would be 4.5 4 because it is the pH that we consider safe to keep uh, uh, clean the water pipes uh, or aerosol target pH in the water 4.55 and the stomach of the piglet that needs a little support at the others is not possible to change or modify it is not very minimally okay great so some very clear numbers uh so thank you for that guidance there diego uh we have a question and i believe uh natalia you hinted on this you mentioned uh elements that are not antibiotics it might have um some role in resistance or may be under pressure um, of course all familiar in europe uh with the coming ban on zinc oxide right so the the question here is can acids help to replace zinc oxide in the production system of course, uh, there is a support, and you, we know it, right? That there are many trials that the ban of zinc oxide in Europe is approaching past, and uh, we were evaluating different solutions. So I see the role of acids in supporting uh, of the replacement, but it's not about take one zinc oxide out, put acids in, and it will work. And unfortunately, it's not that easy. So we have identified that it is important to like to play again to have this comprehensive uh, role of uh, biosecurity um, as well as farm management and uh, in our um, trials in our research we saw a very good efficacy if we combine acidifiers with uh, other uh, phytogenic uh, substances we have a digesterone product line and with that combination we saw a beneficial uh, effects and a possibility to replace zinc oxide yeah, that's interesting, a, a combined approach. So that can be true, I guess, for antibiotic replacement, for zinc replacement, uh, that you will be looking at different levels and different combinations of different types of solutions in order to get to your goals, right? Exactly, yes, absolutely. It's never, it's also with antibiotics uh, replacement. It's never take one substance and replace it with another and it will work uh, as a guarantee. Unfortunately, it's not that easy. Antibiotics is are, are very powerful, yes. Yeah. And of course, we've, we've spent a lot of time talking about uh, bacteria and antibiotic resistance. Uh, here, this question comes from a different, a bit of a different angle, talking about uh, viral infections, viral enteric infections in particular, and if fatty acids uh, can play a role there. Are there any advantages, disadvantages? Uh, has there been any evidence of uh, a good effect against Lasonia, Streptococcus, Glacerella? Mm -hmm. um, yes, I mean, uh, viral infections, it's known that uh, as some acids are used, but uh, we need to differentiate here because in acids we have short chain fatty acids, it's actually acids that we are working with in Viotronic product line, and we have uh, there are also medium chain fatty acids. And uh, uh, we know that solutions that are based on medium chain fatty acids can be used also as antiviral agent. Um, and this could be a support from this side uh, as well. So we do not have medium chain fatty acids in our pro portfolio, but uh, uh, the fact that medium chain fatty acids have efficacy against the uh, virus uh, is um, evident and it's well described also in the literature. And there are also some products on the market uh, using this um, tool and using this uh, possibility. Uh, the, the you know, another part of the question was the efficacy against Lausonia, right? 
um, and the other bacteria. That's right. We had um, Lawsonia, Streptococcus, and Glacerella. Yeah, it's it's uh, like Diego was talking about Lawsonia, right, uh, in, in his presentation. So we could can can get some answers there. Uh, it's not easy to target Lawsonia. It's an intracellular uh, gut pathogen, and uh, with our research, we saw with some uh, in vitro trials, with some cell cell culture trials, uh, that it is possible to like to have support of acids as long as Lawsonia is not getting really intracellular. So it is as long as it is in the gut lumen, it is possible to target and to reduce the load. But when Lawsonia is intracellular stage, and the effect is rather indirect, just improvement of gut health and. Um, uh, that leads to the lower load of Lausonia, but Lausonia remains a challenge. It's not uh, that easy to, uh, I think Diego can even tell more about this, right? Yeah, by a prompt practical point of view, Streptococcus uh, is known that uh, lauric acid is doing something against, because Streptococcus needs to move from the tonsillae is a swallowed, goes down in the, in the intestine, and then is absorbed and creating a problem with a bacteriemia or septicemia. So lauric acid looks like it's doing something, but it's doing very little. Glycerella is the new name from, it was Hemophilus parasuis, now it's Glycerella parasuis, because people don't, don't find new things, so they change name to the old things. Glycerella parasuis is a gram positive, very little to do. But is, remember, is usually the bug you find in clean, in clean farms. So in that case, you can use sometimes a little bit of, of antibiotic because for the time being, there is not a, a, a nutritional strategy about that because is against the all uh, the serial producing uh, structure means uh, pleura means uh, the omentum means the joints uh, and there we cannot go with the acids lusonia yes lusonia but it was uh, is not easy to to reach but when is in the lumen you can kill lusonia with the antibiotic but after three, five, six, seven days, you have to stop. Yesterday, as I heard a vet using 21 days an antibiotic against uh, is crazy. Because you kill only, as uh, Natalia was saying, only what is in the lumen. So creating an adverse environment with acids. And in the ileum, you can do that with the slow release medium and whatever. Then you keep uh, Rosonia under pressure and little by little, at least you keep uh, subclinical. I don't say you, but you really decrease uh, the incidence of the bat. So acids, as uh, for Salmonella, Brachyspira, as was showing, are a strategic tool against these three uh, bugs, Rosonia, Salmonella, Brachyspira. No way, eh? Yeah? and is for the time being the best together with a short chain fatty acid that you can use, or I prefer to help the producer in the intestine are the best fight against these bugs, intracellular or fake intracellular bugs. All right, so a clear and very complete answer. Thank you both for that. Uh, that does bring us to the end of today's discussion uh, as we reach the, the top of the hour. So I do want to thank everyone for having submitted questions. We appreciate your interest. Uh, if we haven't had a chance to get to your question, we will follow up. You'll hear from the biomin rep in the coming days uh, with an answer for you. Uh, Diego, Natalia, once again, it's been a pleasure. I want to thank you for bringing your insights to us today. Thank you, Ryan, for your hospitality. Thank you, Natalia. Thank you very much, everybody, for your support. Yes. And I have just one request for those of you listening today. Um, as we close today's session, you're going to have a very short questionnaire. It takes two minutes to fill out. It lets us know uh, your feedback on this session, if it was useful to you, and how we should shape uh, future topics and continue these discussions in the future. So I want to thank you in advance for completing that.
on behalf of Biomed, I want to thank you for joining us, and I wish you all a great day. Thank you. Have a nice day, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.